Good. Thank you very much. I thank the organizers for inviting me here uh, to talk at this uh, meeting. Uh, it's, of course, a little bit strange to do it online, but uh, I uh, try to do my best to convey my message. My message is rather simple. I will talk about uh, domain walls and how they can influence the critical current in a chiral superconductors. And so we will look at two types of domain walls. Usually people talk about the so-called AB plane domain walls. These are uh, domain walls. Uh, so we, we look at actually at the quasi two-dimensional superconductors. So we have a basically a layered structure. And so we have a basal plane. And if the normal vector of the domain wall lies in the basal plane, that's the standard way most people look at domain walls in chiral superconductors. But there is, of course, also the C-axis domain wall where the normal vector points along the C-axis. And actually, this would be energetically much more favorable type of uh, domain wall uh, for such kind of superconductors. And I would like to show that this has actually interesting properties where selection rules of uh, chiral superconductors play a role. This uh, now I have to see somehow I got stuck. Now it works, yeah. So these are my collaborators for this work. Sara Etter, who did uh, her PhD in my group. Uh, Wen Huang, who is a frequent visitor in my group. And uh, Paolo Molinini, who did his master thesis on a part of this uh, project. So I start with introducing uh, Kyle's superconducting states. So there are various uh, states uh, which are uh, considered in literature. The Kyle P-wave state, which has been considered for some time at least as the candidate uh, state for strontium rusinate. Now there is a big question mark on that uh, because uh, this may not be a triplet su superconductor after all. But the Kyle P-wave state here as such is, of course, an interesting state. It's also... Uh, this, uh, an analog to the A phase of uh, helium-3. It's a triplet state where the, we have equal spin pairing, in-plane spin pairing, and an angular momentum along the C-axis. There is a chiral D-wave state, which has a form like this. So it is nodal in the uh, basal plane. So the, for Kc equals zero, it also this has angular momentum plus or minus along the C-axis. These two states can be realized in tetragonal materials. And so this second state has been considered also as a candidate for explaining uh, superconductivity in uranium, ruthenium to silicon two. And then there is a chiral P D wave state, which has angular momentum uh, two. So uh, like the upper one here, it's a singlet state and it's a candidate for uh, strontium, platinum, arsenic. This is a system which has hexagonal symmetry and this state here needs actually to be realized. Hexagonal symmetry and tetragonal symmetry, this would not be, uh, uh, could not be stabilized. These states break time reversal symmetry. So they are twofold degenerate. They have two component order parameters as we will see shortly. And due to the degeneracy, we can have domain formation and domain walls. So so-called chiral domains. And so let me first talk about the chiral P-wave state as an example. So we can uh, actually parameterize the chiral P-wave state by the positively chiral state and the negative chiral state with the order parameter comp component eta plus and eta minus. These are complex order parameters as they would be used in a Ginsburg-Landau theory as I will uh, introduce shortly. Now, an interesting aspect about this state is that if I have cylindrical symmetry, so I have complete rotation symmetry around the C axis, then there is a equivalence between a U1 gauge transformation and a rotation around the C axis. If I do a U1 gauge transformation, I multiply the order permitted by a phase. If I do a rotation, actually the same thing happens because just rotating uh, an L set equal one state around the C axis just gives nothing else than a phase. So you can undo a gauge transformation by a rotation or vice versa. Now, if I use this two component order parameter 
to uh, uh, formulate the Ginzburg-Landau uh, free energy, then I can expand in this way. And so this has one advantage for discussing uh, uh, domain walls, as we will see afterwards. So there are, there's the second order term, there are uh, fourth order terms, and there are a number of gradient terms where I use here gradient terms for in-plane uh, dependence, but we have also gradients for uh, C-axis dependence of the order parameter, where pi is the covariant uh, uh, derivative here. And then I have uh, pi plus minus, which have this uh, structure, this chiral structure, which also enter here. Now, in this system here, or in this uh, formulation here, I introduce the parameter nu. The parameter nu appears in some of these terms and actually has an, an important uh, information. If the system is fully cylindrically symmetric, nu is equal to zero. This kind of average here would be equal to zero. And one can rather easily, looking at these uh, terms here, identify that uh, such a kind of averaging has to be uh, happening here because uh, we have here the complex conjugal gate of eta plus and here eta minus. And so if I take the phases of the two together, I get an e to the i for zeta. And so this is only finite if I have real crystalline an anisotropy of a tetragonal system. And so now, I use this uh, ginzburg landau free energy to discuss domain walls. So before going to uh, domains, domain walls, uh, so the domains, of course, we have these two domains, one with positive and one with negative chirality. There have been in literature some experiments interpreted by domains and domain walls, for example, uh, this uh, experiment by the von Harlingen group on attaching uh, lead to, on the side to strontium ruthenate. It was observed that you have uh, strong hysteresis effects on the Fraunhofer pattern, and this can be neatly interpreted that uh, domain walls actually intersect the interface between uh, lead and strontium ruthenate. Then on Monday, we had a poster uh, uh, actually presented by Remko Fermin, where uh, act, uh, in such kind of uh, FIB uh, structured uh, loops of strontium ruthenate, uh, interference pattern have been observed, which you do not expect in this way. And so it was in, uh, interpreted that actually domain walls appear here spontaneously and uh, making here effective chooses and junctions. And then uh, many years ago, for another type of superconductor, a heavy fermion superconductor, uranium uh, beryllium-13, which you can uh, dope with thorium. And then when you dope it with thorium, in some doping range, you get a double phase transition where the low temperature phase actually is time reversal symmetry breaking. And what the group of Anacelia Mota actually observed is, if you look at the flux creep here, then if you take the pure sample, you have here a, a creep rate, which depends on temperature linearly. That's like Kim Anderson. However, if you look at the, this uh, temperature dependence here, where you go into the time reversal symmetry breaking state, you see as soon as you go into the time reversal symmetry breaking state, the, transition, the creep rate uh, collapses. And this was interpreted as uh, that the uh, domain walls actually impede uh, flux creep. And if you do this uh, experiment and do it field cooled, you can actually remove this feature and the uh, creep uh, recovers, uh, which was of course quite good in agreement that you would have domains which you can remove by field cooling. So that's a few experiments uh, which have been interpreted in the past by domain walls. And so it is worthwhile to look a little bit more deeply at domain walls. So let me look at the structure of domain walls here. So I have a minus and a plus domain uh, meeting at the domain wall here. So I have 
On the minus side, I have eta minus finite. On the plus side, I have eta plus finite. They interpenetrate. And so the width of this domain wall here or the interpenetration is of the order of uh, coherence length. And now we can look at what happens uh, for the two condensates which interpenetrate to each other. So we uh, parameterize the uh, order parameters here in this way. We have here a modulus, which uh, just uh, for one order parameter it behaves like the, the, this green line here, like the red line. And so you can just uh, get this modulus by switching the sign for the two cases. And then we have a phase. And so now the question is actually, how do these two domains couple? There is a phase. Is there a phase coherent coupling between the two domains? And so we will see that this is not entirely trivial that there uh, such a uh, uh, coherent coupling exists. Sometimes we have uh, actually uh, selection rules which do not admit this. And so if I look at this here, uh, if I have an eta plus times an eta minus order parameter, then this uh, corresponds just to this product. And this is only finite in this uh, overlap region. And so we have to look at the uh, Ginsburg-Landau energy and identify uh, terms which describe just this overlap between the two. And that we can do by looking here now at the free energy. And I have here colored all the terms which have such an interface uh, coupling. So here, no such coupling happens. Also here, no such coupling happens. And also for the set derivatives here, no such coupling happens. But there are two four-forded terms which couple. This is this uh, yellow and uh, orange one. And then I have two gradient terms where the gradients are in the plane only, not along the z-axis. And so now let's look at these terms and uh, see how they depend on the phase difference of the two order parameters on the two sides. The first term here, which I have from up here, has no phase dependence. However, the second term has a phase dependence. And also the two gradient terms have a phase dependence. Their phase dependence is different. Here, this is, has a cosine 2 phi, these have cosine phi. Now, I have here colored also new. If I have rotation symmetry, these terms here with the new vanish, uh, they are only finite if I have crystalline anisotropy. And so the question is under which circumstances they contribute to the coupling, the phase coupling of the two. If I would not have a phase, an energy dependence of uh, depending on the phase, uh, uh, an energy depending on the phase, then I would not have coherent coupling between the two sides because the energy is then independent of the, uh, the phase of, on the two sides and you cannot uh, influence or you cannot uh, run the current through a Josephson junction to through a, a domain wall like that. So let's look first at the AB domain wall. And so if I take all the terms together, I which uh, a couple the two do domain walls, then I see I have here from the gradient terms, I have a term which depends on cosine uh, phi. It has one component with, with, uh, which is depending on the anisotropy. This depends on the uh, gradient of the two. Uh, uh, of the, the spatial dependence of the modulus of the order parameter, it's smaller than zero. So it's uh, maximal uh, or minimal if phi is equal to zero. And then we have the four forward terms here, which have a phase dependence, which de is also proportional to nu here with, with cosine two phi. And uh, the F4 term here is positive. And so now, I can look at how does the anisotropy influence the phase coherence on the two sides, of the two sides. And so if the system is isotropic, then nu is zero. This term doesn't exist here. And I have here like a, a, temp, a phase dependence of the energy, 
like the red line here. And the maximal, uh, the minimal energy is at phi equals zero. This is like for a Josephson junction. And so this is perfectly phase coherent. So the two sides uh, communicate with each other through the phase. Interesting is when I turn on new, then uh, we can actually get a situation where we have two minima here. They can be at some arbitrary position here, not at some specific situation. And so then if I look at this, I have two uh, non-trivial stable solutions for the domain wall with the phase difference like this, positive and negative. Interestingly, I uh, can have here uh, solitons between the two solutions, which carry actually fractional flux. So we can have fractional vortices in this situation. For the red uh, curve, there would be like in a Josephson junction, there would be only standard quantized vortices. And so I have here phase coherence in both cases. Now let's look at the C-axis domain wall. For the C-axis domain wall, I have only the terms which are uh, from the fourth order terms. The gradient terms do not contribute here. So I have only these terms. When nu is equal to zero, I have actually no phase coherence at all. So the energy doesn't depend on the phase. This means the two, the domains decouple completely. They, they cannot communicate through the phase to each other. And it is somehow clear from the selection rule, which I have uh, uh, mentioned before, if I take uh, the, the uh, domain below and the domain up, and I change the phase, I can undo it by a rotation. And since it's rotation symmetric on both sides, then I can uh, just uh, uh, change by, uh, the orientation and I will not get any uh, 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 dependence on the phase difference. We will see this afterwards also from a microscopic point of view. However, if, if I start to turn on new, for example, I take a positive new, then I get a phase coherence as I show here. And the minima here are at pi over two plus or minus pi over two. two. I can also get here a soliton. I will show this afterwards. And this would correspond to half flux quanta. So I get phase coherence here through the anisotropy. And so the phase coherence here is, of course, then uh, generally not so big as it uh, could be for a standard uh, uh, for a uh, standard like Josephson junction like situation. Now, let me look at this also from a microscopic point of view. So, we looked also uh, at this doing a Vogel with Tischen type of theory, where I use uh, such a, when I have cylindrical symmetry, I have a situation like this that uh, kx plus iky is just k times e to the i plus theta k. Theta k is the angle uh, of the k vector in plane. And so if I look now at how the two sides communicate, they communicate via uh, Andreev states. So an electron goes from one side to uh, from one domain to the other and is reflected as a whole. And so I have here an electron hole superposition. And the energy here depends on the phase the electron encounters on this and this side. So what they couple here. So the energy here is depending on phi minus 2 theta k when I just take the phase difference between the two order parameters for a given direction of the electron. So now if I want to calculate what is the energy of these uh, Andreev bound states as a function of phi, then I just do an integral over all angles uh, in the in-plane angles uh, for this energy for states which are occupied. And since I can now rotate again freely, this cannot be uh, this cannot depend on the phase phi because uh, just uh, you integrate it away. 
So this is a consequence of the equivalence of the rotation uh, on the U1 gauge symmetry. So you have a uh, you have simply a selection rule. Uh, other in another way said a uh, Cooper pair with uh, positive and with negative L Z component cannot just uh, communicate with each other. Now, if I go and change to an anisotropic situation, then the, actually the energy does not only depend anymore on phi minus two theta k, but also on the direction, because now, for example, the, on the Fermi surface, the Fermi velocities are anisotropic, and then immediately you get a uh, phase dependence, and this phase dependence is just, in a way, as I have shown before, it's uh, basically the uh, same kind of phase difference like cosine 2 phi. Maybe higher harmonics are involved here uh, because I have before only take an, taken an expansion. When you do this for a type binding model, where you can simply tune uh, anisotropy by changing the chemical potential and so changing the band filling, and we use uh, such a kind of uh, nearest neighbor type of uh, chiral P wave state, then you can show that uh, actually by tuning around and look uh, changing the uh, anisotropy, you can change this kind of uh, uh, phase dependence of the energy. See, you have to be aware here that this goes only from zero to pi. That's why we see here only one. Uh, so we see only. Uh, half of what I have shown before. And depending on which sign you have for nu, you have uh, the, here the opposite way. So if nu is positive, then the minimum is at pi over two, as I've shown before. Otherwise, it is uh, at zero and pi here if it's nu is negative. And if nu is zero, here you see also that uh, it would be zero. Now, how do I, can I test uh, what is the, uh, how strongly the two domains are coupled and what would be the critical current. And so, of course, you can try to run a current through this uh, domain wall, but a more elegant way is to look actually at what happens with a vortex. And so the interesting thing here is, as I have mentioned before, we can have half-flux vortices because our domain wall has a plus pi over two and a minus pi over two. Uh, uh, solution. And so when I have these two do, uh, types of domain walls uh, meeting at a line, a line defect here, then I have here a phase winding. And this phase, phase winding is only a phase winding by pi. So I have a flux quantum, I have a flux quantum. And so uh, when I look at the phase now, I would have such a kind of soliton. You can now calculate what is the magnetic field, and the magnetic field is here just spread uh, a little bit along the domain wall, slightly entering also at the upper and the lower uh, domain. And we have a critic, uh, we have a current here which runs around here. So now this is just uh, the current going along the c axis, uh, upwards and downwards uh, along the domain wall. And so Taking the analog of uh, uh, Josephson vortex, then we could I, we can identify, for example, the maximum of this current with, with a critical current. And so what we then see is that uh, we can also identify this with the spread of the flux here. So this is has to do with the screening. And if we go gradually with new towards zero, so with the anisotropy to, uh, uh, so we go uh, with the system to more isotropic situation, then the screening length diverges and the critical current goes to zero. And so you can test that you decouple the domains uh, by going to an isotropic situation. And so this uh, basically is just reflected through the fact that new that the phase dependence of the domain wall energy is here in this case just proportional to nu. 
so you can uh, do uh, simulate this vortex here with uh, detailed uh, Ginsburg Landau calculation, and you can show that uh, this is actually true. You're, you can fit JC, uh, you could also fit the, the uh, screening length, and you would uh, see that when U goes to zero, that this current, the critical current, goes away, and the two uh, domains are decoupled. Now let's do the same thing for the D wave, the chiral D wave state, which I have uh, uh, mentioned before. Also here we can write the uh, gap function by the two components of the order parameter, the plus and the minus uh, chirality domain. Also here we have a situation that we have a certain equivalence of gauge transformation and rotation along the, around the C-axis. By a rotation, a rotation by phi gives here an e to the plus i two i phi or minus two i phi depending on the two domains. Uh, but nevertheless, by cert, by a rotation, uh, you can undo uh, gauge transformation. So we are in this very much in the same situation as here for the Kyle P wave state. Now let us look here at the Ginzburg-Landau energy. This looks different for the, uh, this situation. Here we have to use uh, hexagonal crystal symmetry when we want to have an isotropy. And so we have different terms. We see here we have one, we have two fourth order terms. We have uh, several uh, uh, gradient terms also along the C axis. And new here is uh, corresponding to the uh, averaging of e to the six uh, e, uh, e to the i six theta k and it appears here in basically only this term here at this order and so let us look at again which terms contribute to the uh, interaction between the domains and so these are only two in this case the four for the term which has no phi dependence at all and the uh, the gradient term, which is a cosine phi uh, dependence. And so if I look here at the situation for the in-plane, so for the AB domain, which has the normal vector in the AB plane, the domain wall energy is given in this way. We have uh, cosine phi dependence. Here again, we have this uh, phi 2. We have no phi, phi uh, F2, which is negative. We have no uh, dependence uh, on the uh, fourth order term. And so if mu is equal to zero, this goes away. Without an crystal anisotropy, here we don't have any coupling in the plane, while when we uh, turn on uh, the coupling, uh, the anisotropy, we get actually uh, dispersion with phi. Actually, this is the wrong way around. It should be pointing downwards. So the phi equals zero should be uh, smaller. Sorry for that. Now, this is not completely true. If I go to terms with higher orders in the gradient, I can actually get a weak uh, dispersion also for uh, isotropic situation. But in lowest order, as we do usually in Ginsburg-Landau, uh, we would not have any coupling. So the coupling between the domains is in the plane already weak. If I go along the C axis, then the term which we had before in the Ginsburg-Landau formulation will not give any phi dependence for the domain wall energy. I have to go here also to higher order terms in the Ginsburg-Landau formulation, and that's a higher order term, a sixth order term, and it is easy to see this is the only term which we find there, which has then a cosine 6 phi, and it is proportional to nu. So we have no coupling here also along the c-axis between the chiral domains uh, for analogous reasons when we have uh, cylindrical symmetry. If we have an isotropy, we can have 6 cosine 6 phi dependence. This actually allows for uh, one-third quantized vortices, uh, which uh, we didn't actually simulate, but this is uh, straightforward. And so we have uh, 
here also a rather similar situation as for the Carl D wave state. So I come to my summary here. So domain walls limit currents and it's the limit currents especially efficient when the domain wall lies in the basal plane. So if the, C, uh, the normal vector is along the C axis, these are the cheapest domain walls. And so the reason for that is that since the coupling is weak here, the phase coupling, the vortices which we create in this here are also rather spread out, very cheap, and we have cheap phase slips here. So the limit for running currents here is uh, so the, uh, is rather strong. So we have a rather strong decoupling here. While when we have no domains, then the critical current would be large. Phase slips would be expensive, and so. It would be an interesting experiment to look at uh, such tower-like structures for a chiral uh, superconductor and just look whether we observe a sort of uh, history-dependent, cooling history-dependent critical currents uh, that if we have domain walls that the critical currents are small, but if we, for example, do field cooling, uh, removing domains, uh, so making a single domain sample that we would have a large critical current. That would be an interesting experiment. And then the other thing is that we can trap uh, fractional fluxes in these uh, domain walls uh, due to anisotropy. These are fractional or we can, could also see uh, fractional quant uh, flux quantization uh, depending on the cooling history by doing such kind of squid type of uh, devices where we attach a conventional superconductor on the side of a Kyle superconductor uh, just along the C axis here, the void, the void being in plane here. Good, that's all I wanted to tell. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm ready to take questions now.